Now, the embattled former water and sanitation minister, Cecilia Abinadapa, walked out of an Accra High Court free, and all her money and other items seized returned to her following decision by the Office of the Special Prosecutor to, to discontinue all cases against her. Now, this decision was taken after a series of in-chamber hearings on the matter. The Special Prosecutor for months now has had in its custody monies of Cecilia Dapa seized when her house was searched as part of the investigations. Now, the office also froze some bank account of Cecilia Dapa for allegedly being tainted with corruption and corruption-related activities. But after seven months, months, the special prosecutor, KC Ejabeng, told the media that on the totality of the gathered evidence and intelligence, it became clear that the case is largely in the province of suspected money laundering. On 24 July 2023, the office placed Ms. Dapa under arrest on charges of corruption and corruption-related offenses. The office subsequently conducted searches in three residential properties associated with Ms. Dapa and Mr. Osekufo at cantonments, Abilinkpe and Tesano in Accra. The searches, which were carried out over a period of two weeks, led to the discovery of the cash sums of 590,000 United States dollars and 2,730,000 cities. Ms. Dapa and Mr. Osekufo could not readily provide a reasonable explanation as to the sources of the cash sums. Authorized officers of the office seized the discovered cash sums on reasonable grounds that they were suspected tainted property. In accordance with Section 321 of the Office of the Special Prosecutor Act 2017, Act 959, as it was necessary to exercise the power of seizure to prevent concealment of the cash sums. The Special Prosecutor, considering it necessary to facilitate the investigations, issued a freezing order against the bank accounts and investments of Ms. Dapa, domiciled at Prudential Bank Limited and Societe General Ghana. Upon the refusal by the High Court to confirm the pre freezing and seizure orders in August 2023, the office re-seized the cash sums and refroze the bank accounts and investments and applied to the court again for confirmation. In FT 0074-2023, the Special Prosecutor versus Cecilia Abinadapa and Daniel Osekufo. Extensive investigation was conducted in country involving 20 persons and three state institutions, and especially in the Ashanti region, to establish the financial standing of Ms. Dapa's deceased brother during his lifetime and at the time of his death since it was alleged the substantial portion of the cash sums belonged to Ms. Dapa's deceased brother. From October 2023, investigation became cross-border and transboundary upon the claim by the persons of interest that part of the seized cash sums was transported to Ghana from the United States. For that reason, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, of the United States became involved in a collaborative investigative work with the office on the matter. Investigation has been aimed at determining the sources of the large cash sums associated with Ms. Dapa and Mr. Osei Kufo. The office has had the benefit of seven months of in-country and four months of collaborative transboundary investigation. Members of the press, on the totality of the gathered evidence and intelligence, it seems to us that the case is largely in the province of suspected money laundering and structuring. By operation of law, the Economic and Organized Crime Office, IOKU, has a specific and direct mandate in respect of suspected cases of money laundering and its an attendant activity of structuring. ...of the Special Prosecutor is referring the case to IOKU for continued investigation and further action. The office will be in close collaboration with Yoko and continued collaboration with the FBI. A little over an hour ago, the office discontinued its application that was pending before the High Court for a confirmation of the seizure and freezing orders in pursuance of the referral of the case to Yoko. The court ordered that the office should return the cash sums and defreeze the accounts of uh, an investment of Ms. Dapa within 72 hours. The 
office also discontinued the procedural criminal charge against Ms. Dapa for failure to return forms on declaration of property and income since that was mounted on the original application for confirmation of the seizure and freezing orders, which was discontinued earlier in time. Now, the question still remains whether the entire exercise was a waste of time. Now, Kisia Jabin disagrees. The contrary. It is an extensive investigation of the Office of the Special Prosecutor with the collaborative work of the FBI that has led us to this conclusion. If the Office of the Special Prosecutor had a direct mandate by law in respect of suspected money laundering and structuring, there will be no such referral. But we operate within the confines of the law. And since the law that created the OSP did not necessarily grant such a direct mandate in respect of uh, suspected money laundering, but the law that created the Economic and Organized Crime Office states specifically that they have a mandate in respect of uh, suspected money laundering. Now, after seven months of investigation, we have a body of uh, evidence. So if we have come to the conclusion that it suggests it seems to us that it is more in relation to suspected money laundering. Then the proper thing to do is to refer it to the uh, state institution, which by law has a direct mandate, as stated in the act. Hindsight wisdom is always awesome. Those who are saying that are only doing so with hindsight wisdom. It's because we've had seven months of such extensive investigation to come to the conclusion we've arrived at. You cannot begin a case when you, uh, we cannot begin making conclusions on a case a week or two after commencing investigation. But after piecing together all, all your evidence and all the testimony and all, everything that you have done, something should then suggest to you. If after seven months we did not have anything, we will just let it go. You get it? But after seven months, I think that we should be commended that we've been able to do such extensive work and have international collaboration as part uh, 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 of this matter. That is to say, we left no stone unturned, and that is what is uh, uh, leading us to this uh, outcome, as I just announced. So once again, I will say, it is very nice to have hindsight wisdom, but we did not have the benefit of hindsight wisdom. We have arrived at the present wisdom through hard work and sheer grit. Now, despite the slow progress of work, the special prosecutor, Kisi Jabing, said the office remains the only hope in the fight against corruption. The day you lose faith in this office is the day the soul of this country dies. See, the repetition you see is merely as a result of the period within which the law requires the office to report, six months. See, even when you are prosecuting a matter in court, six months, by the record, it's like a day. You get it? If the law had required us to uh, make periodic um, uh, reports, let's say two years, three years, you won't see uh, this level of, of repetition. But what is so bad about repetition, especially when the matter is still pending and the matter is not, is not, is not yet resolved? And you would see that, although much of it looks like repetition, there's always a slight update in respect of the cases. Some are moved up in respect of the level at which the office has, has, has got into and whether the office is, is going to take uh, further action. So you see that case um, um, uh, reported in June that the office is still ongoing with the investigations. Then in December, you see that the office has concluded the investigation in respect of that matter and that the special prosecutor will be giving further directions uh, 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 along, along those lines. It's just an update to tell you that between June and December of that year, there has been some uh, 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 conclusive points upon which the office can then further act. So you see that case repeated, but the notations and I Slightly different from what you saw in June. Quick example is uh, this one on the, uh, um, on, the, on, the, on the police recruitment uh, back, back, back then. Consistently, you see it being repeated. But in December, we reported that the investigation has concluded. So you see it running all the way from 2021. But its repetition in here doesn't mean that we are resting on our OS. And it is best if we keep reminding the public of 
of, of, of these occurrences. Otherwise, you might see a case in there, and then the case vanishes from the report, and you don't even know what happened to the case. Then you'll be asking us questions. We've consistently been seeing this investigation, but you've omitted it from the report, and you didn't tell us the well, let's bring in a private legal practitioner, lawyer Alexander Kojokom Aban, who believes a thriving asset declaration regime in Ghana could have resolved this matter. Now, he joins us via Zoom here. Grateful for you to join us here. Yeah. First off, uh, what do you make of what the OSP has done? Thank you very much, and uh, greetings to your cherished viewers. Mm. I think I've done otherwise because um, the law that governs their activity mm -hmm. deals more with issues of corruption. Okay. And I tell you that when it comes to issues of corruption, it is very, very difficult to prove because two persons or three decide to do something outside of the law and outside the views of law enforcers. Mm. And so definitely, if you want to go and say somebody has been involved in corruption or corruption-related activities. The law also requires that you who are alleged, that is the state, will have to prove. But as it stands now, we will have to only be in the realm of conjecture. Mm. Probably your, your guess may be as good as mine that this money may not have been acquired through any legitimate means. It is not to say specifically that uh, Ms. Dapa uh, has maybe uh, found some illegitimate ways of uh, getting this money. Mm. Because that will have to be proved beyond reasonable doubt in court. Now, if we had serious asset regime, I mean asset declaration regime, where we would know that indeed uh, Ms. The power or any other person who is going into political office mm -hmm. has properly declared his or her assets. Okay. You would then realize mm -hmm. that at least if the person is living above his or her means, we would then have cause to ask the person to give reasonable explanation as to how she or he or she came by okay. the huge amount found in her in her house so 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 we don't have that we don't have that functional asset uh, declaration regime but the osp's office which we created to help us solve this seem to be going through a lot of challenges in in the work that they do what could possibly be the reason and how do we cure it because you are a lawyer yourself and and possibly even part of those who created this Yes, I was in Parliament when this law was created. Mm. I admit. But uh, to me, probably I would say I stand vindicated somehow. The reason being that um, at the time this law was being done, mm. I said that um, it is not the multiplication of the laws that we are passing which will cure the counter of corruption in the country. As of now, you know as I do, that corruption hasn't gone down at all, even with the creation of the Office of Special Prosecutor. Mm. For me, I think what happened really was to give political credit to those who uh, as they thought about it and bet it. Okay. But in terms of its use to fight corruption, I think we have failed. Okay. Now... And for uh, me, mm. the existing laws were enough to, to fight corruption. Fight corruption, yes. Okay. Now, the, the case has been referred to the EOCO. Can we trust the EOCO to do a good job on this matter? I doubt. The reason being that they will still come face to face with the same law. The law would be that prove the guilt of Ms. Dapa beyond reasonable doubt. The law would be to state that looking at her previous position mm, okay. prior to taking political office, 
She didn't have this money. Okay. But here is the case. We do not do serious asset declaration okay. uh, in the way we have to before mm. people get into political office. So how are you going to, what will be the basis? Because if you have a base mm. information to say that at the time she was coming into politics, this was how much she was worth. And now she has all this. And looking at the salary and all other requisites that go with her office, mm. she couldn't have gained all this amount during the period of her stay in public office. Okay. Then you are making a case. Okay. But so, so we do not have any basis. All How right. are you going to do that? So you don't think that Ioko will do a good job on this? I'm grateful to you, lawyer, for joining us here. Lawyer, could you come Urban there? Now to other stories. And finding a working defibrillator, a tool that is used to shock patients back to life in FM Kranta Regional Hospital in the Western region is akin to the ninth wonder of the world. Now the sole defibrillator in the hospital is currently faulty and was donated by foreign students. Health workers are distressed and are crying for a working defibrillator, insisting it is becoming difficult to save patients who are in cardiac arrest. Jojo Kobina has more in today's episode of Sick Hospitals. A defibrillator is a life-saving equipment. When the heart is not beating normally, the defibrillator is used to deliver controlled electric shock to the heart. This shock can help restore the heart's normal rhythm in cases of sudden cardiac arrest. In countries like South Korea and the UK, defibrillators can be found in public places like pubs, markets, and crowded places. What about Ghana? The Ghana Harmonized Health Facility Assessment Report 2023 says only 5% of hospitals in Ghana have the required basic equipment in consulting rooms. We make our way to Ghana's oil city, Takrade. The Fianquanta Regional Hospital receives referrals from across the region. It is fair to say that it serves over 3 million population. Apart from cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, which involves chest compressions and rescue breaths, can the hospital save your life if you go into cardiac arrest? Well, um, I would say that uh, we're doing the best that we can uh, under the circumstances. At the A&E, where you are most likely to be taken to, uh, we have just one defibrillator. Um, but for a, a unit of that size, uh, we should have more. So in your case, if you are the only one who needs the machine at that point in time, yes, we will be able to, to do it for you. But if there are many patients who need the same service, then it becomes a challenge. Dr. Joseph Kodotambil, the medical superintendent of the hospital, is passionate. He wants his medical staff to get the best equipment to serve patients. But he also wears another hat to manage the information he gives the media and also assure residents of the Western region and beyond that he can rely on this facility. With some hesitation, he admits that even the only available defibrillator has challenges and calls for resourcing of the hospital. And, and the defibrillator doesn't work properly, like it functions um, With well. a few challenges, but with batteries and, and all that, but um, when, when called upon, it, 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 it would function. But like I said, we don't... We need more of those uh, machines uh, rather than just one. So we went to the Accident Emergency Center to find out how the facility handles cases of cardiac arrest. We have uh, one automated external defibrillator. It's faulty because the battery is irreplaceable. So the battery went down and we can't uh, replace it. So now it's malfunctioning. So when we have, if our patients suddenly arrest, it's difficult for us to determine the rhythm so that we can apply the shock. We are not able to do that. There's a life-saving machine. You can have cardiac arrest at any point in time. When we are intervening, it's a, it's a must that we have an automated external defibrillator. The only defibrillator, which is now 40, was even donated by foreign students who saw the need for the equipment in the emergency room. To make you understand the issue better, 
Regina Kweku, the unit head of the Accident and Emergency Center, shares a recent story. We had this patient that was brought in with electrical shock. With that one, you know, because of the external electrical current, it sends the rhythm to a different the patient to a different rhythm. So if we had this, we could have reversed, we could have shocked the patient to set the rhythm to the normal. But because we didn't have, we continued with our CPR, CPR, and when we were all exhausted, we had to call it. For those who do not understand what the term call it, it simply means they had pronounced the patient dead. How often do they call it? So it does happen very often very often the search for a defibrillator at the fian quanta took me to the intensive care unit here they provide critical care to patients the unit also needs a defibrillator is there one here mavis mills is a supervisor at the icu we need um for now we don't even have a defibrillator here they brought one but they said that there was a problem with their battery. So they sent it and for now we don't have a defibrillator. You are anywhere in the western region uh, and when something happens to you, like an accident or you have a heart attack or, uh, or some other uh, condition, you are most likely to be brought to a fear encounter. And um, if we are not in the best um, situation to be able to help you, uh, the consequences can be dire. So we want to uh, appeal to all of them to, I mean, to look at this place. Uh, uh, let, let, let's collaborate and see where they can put their money in uh, to improve on the quality of services uh, for Efian Kwanta. And if you, they do so, it is for the entire citizenry uh, of the Western region and even beyond. Clearly, the Fion Quanta Regional Hospital needs healing. George Kopna, join news. Well, let's have a chat on this. And joining us via Zoom is Kwame Sapansiedu, pharmacist and research fellow at CDD Ghana. Uh, grateful for joining us. How did we get here as a nation? Um, I'd say good evening. Um, and good evening to your listeners. We got here because we haven't, from a policy and political standpoint, invested in health infrastructure. And that's, that's how we got here. Mm. It's sad. Mm. But, but if that's how we got here, how do we change the narrative? Well, it's about being intentional and purposeful and deciding that we value the lives of our citizens and people shouldn't die like chickens where CPR cannot revive you and even without health professionals knowing that you've actually passed, they call it. Mm. We, it it's a, about being intentional. And I don't think our politicians are intentional enough. Mm. They mm. don't procure health care in our jurisdiction. And therefore, sometimes think that as a result, they can get away with the rest of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Procuring healthcare at this level. And, and, and that, that's, that's the fundamental truth. So it means that's where the answer lies, that our politicians should change the way they, they view healthcare. I'm grateful to you for joining us here, Doc. Well, now, the United Kingdom is set to send some, some of Ghana's crown jewels back home 150 years after looting them from the court of the Ashanti King. The gold artifact will, will be loaned to Ashanti Kingdom following a three-year agreement with the two forces to the second. Thirty-two looted golden artifacts displayed in UK museums have been shuttled for return to Ghana. Most of the items which are to be loaned to its custodial owners were taken during the 19th century wars between the British and the Asante. The items included a golden pipe, sword of state and gold badges, 
won by officials charged with cleansing the soul of the king. Both the UK and the Asantehini have reached a three-year agreement where the loaned artifact will be displayed in the Mensha Palace Museum as part of the Asantehini Silver Jubilee celebration. The agreement is subject to three years extension after which they will be repatriated to the UK museums. The UK is deliberately refusing to permanently return stolen artifacts in their custody to their countries of origin, hence the enactment of legislation to protect them. The decision has been met with criticisms from a section of the Ghanaian public. The Asante gold artifact are the ultimate symbol of the Asante royal government and are believed to be invested with the spirit of former Asante kings. Now the man who led the negotiation with the UK, Ivo Ajimandria, joins us on the telephone for detailed discussion on this. Grateful for joining us. Um, now he is joining us via Zoom now. How long did the negotiation last? It's been running for the last nine months. We started in May uh, last year and we concluded some two weeks or so ago. Mm. And when are these artifacts coming into the country? Most likely between April and May of this year. Yeah. How do you react to a section of the I mean, public who feel that the UK should rather return the stolen items in their custody other than loaning it to its original owners? I would say this is a legitimate question to ask uh, in the light of what happened uh, in 1874. These obviously were looted objects that were taken to Britain in particular, but some of them also found their found ways in European museums and uh, some crossed the Atlantic to the Americas. So obviously the history of the objects uh, dictate that uh, people can easily ask this uh, question like this. Uh, let me make question. But then we were also operating within the historical antecedents of the time. Looted objects, yes. Um, but the British have them. They have them and they have and added laws around the, the these objects. Said like that is very difficult. The laws of antiquity are very strong laws. And museums, national museums in particular in the UK, cannot permanently return these objects, even if there are there is a goodwill by workers, by museum economists who feel that they should look at the laws again. As it is now, it cannot. So as it cannot, we only had to, to look into what was possible. And the loan agreement of possibly six years was what was available. And mind you, we've been talking about the return of these objects for close to 50 years. And um, we had not made any headway. So, we needed to change strategy along the line. We needed to look at other options. In particular, uh, for this year, which is 150 years since they were taken, the centenary year of Prempe's return from Ezra, and as you rightly said, Otun was on silver jubilee. So at least to have these objects return home, to have a feel of uh, the creativity of forebears or something that had been on the minds of many. Mm. I wish we can talk more on this, but I'm grateful that you join us here. This is still John News Prime. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more. Do stay. Welcome back from the break. Now, Land and Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abu Jinapur has disclosed exclusively to John News that the economic management team is considering a feasibility study on the possible withdrawal of value added tax on mining exploration in Ghana. The Trade Union Congress at news conference a couple of days ago questioned why the sector minister Samuel Abujinapo is giving a free pass to rich multinational mining companies while government is imposing a 15% value added tax on electricity consumers above lifeline level. Now, Dr. Yaoba, a secretary general of the Trade Union Congress. The Trade Union Congress is scaling up their fight against government's imposition of a 15% value added tax on power consumption above lifeline levels. As the controversial policy takes off, the labor unions say they are appalled by the decision of the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry to withdraw value added tax on mining exploration in Ghana. Why government is imposing VAT on us, residential customers of electricity? Plans are far advanced to remove VAT on mineral exploration in Ghana.
for wealthy multinational mining companies. The statement from the labor unions is prompting a sharp response from the Ghana Chamber of Mines, which says the reasons for government's impending policy is largely misconstrued. Suleiman Kone is chief executive officer of the Ghana Chamber of Mines. There are various phases of, of mining. So you start with exploration. And that phase of exploration, you don't have revenue because you're exploring. As the controversy rages on between organized labor and the Chamber of Mines, Land and Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abujina says Ghana's economic management team will make a final determination on the matter. I think it's a matter that we have to interrogate and, and examine. And it's a matter that is currently before the economic management team of government, uh, which is being examined. Uh, thoroughly and dispassionately. We need to strike a careful balance. The balance between taxing the industry, which I believe the Chamber and all of us agree, um, is, is one that we cannot escape, as well as also making the Ghanaian mining industry uh, attractive in terms of uh, attracting investment into the industry. Because the bedrock of every mining industry is exploration. Without exploration, you don't have the industry, because the exploration that an S or that reveals whatever resources you have. And so um, if you have a regime which makes exploratory activities uh, unattractive, your industry eventually will collapse. Meanwhile, President Ekofuado says the wealth of mineral deposits in Ghana and other African countries ought to position the continent as a powerhouse and not a group of people who economically are challenged. The president, who was opening the African Prosperity Dialogues at the Peduasi Presidential Lodge, called for harmonization of trade and economic policies among African countries in order to leverage on the mineral resources of these countries for collective prosperity. The president is hopeful that the African Continental Free Trade Area Framework will go a long way to boost growth for the African people. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that Africa is blessed. Africa is not a poor continent. In fact, she's too rich to be poor. A continent has every natural resource imaginable, oil, gas, minerals, and an abundance of sunlight. We have some 65% of all arable land available to feed 9 billion people globally by 2050. In our continent, is home to the most youthful population in the world. We have everything we need to transform Africa into a global powerhouse of the future. We must therefore remind ourselves consistently of the projects, the prospects she has, and our individual and collective responsibility to turn prospects into productivity that can generate prosperity for our people. I'm excited, I'm proud that once again, I've had the privilege to host the Africa Prosperity Dialogues. Uh, cocoa smuggling is stalling road project in the OT region and other parts of the country. That according to the OT regional minister who is tasking the chiefs of the region to help deal with the menace. Speaking during a sensitization program ahead of a reaffirmation exercise by the Ghana Boundary Commission to replace all destroyed boundary pillars in the region, the OT Regional Minister Joshua Makubu says the Volta and OT regions, which together produced 8,000 tons of cocoa, are now experiencing a drop to just 100 tons. And in, unlike Ghana, where we subsidize fertilizers to cocoa farmers, we provide chemicals and also help them to maintain their farms. Our neighboring Togo doesn't do the same. So there are price differentials, and there's always that temptation to want to carry the, what they call it, uh, cocoa beans across the borders, especially some, uh, excuse me, I don't want to say criminally minded uh, individual who will buy it from the farmers and go and do that. That is making us lose a lot of cocoa. The other issue some of the farmers are raising is that the local buying uh, companies that are in town do not have the money to do that. That I'm going to, as a matter of agency, cross-check from Cocoa Board and ensure that whatever funds that are needed to be able to purchase the cocoa beans produced in the OT region will be made available. As we speak now, in 2019, where Volta and OT used to contribute about 8,000 tons to the cocoa stock in Ghana. But as we speak now, we are struggling to even be able to make 100 tons. 
Our grief resident of Ashaiman are warning politicians not to canvass for vote in the municipality due to what they describe as eight years of neglect, mainly of road infrastructure. According to them, Desmai pleas and numerous demonstrations over the state of their road, no improvements have occurred. They want politicians to stay away from political campaigns there until roads are fully rehabilitated. Carlos Caloni has the rest of the story. The level of dust you see behind me is what a resident of Ashaiman grapple with every day. Many of the roads in this municipality are very deplorable and for that reason, they are saying, sending a stern warning to the new patriotic party and all politicians not to step their foot in Ashaiman to canvass for votes. If they don't attend to the roads in Ashima, nobody, we mean, no single soul, a political party from wherever they should venture in Ashima here, coming to campaign. If they come, we will use our lives as sacrifice for the people of Ashima because Ashima belongs to Ghana. And the population that they always get here, any political party, NDC, NPP, when they conduct votes, what they get here is very huge. And they think we are fools. We are not fools. We are not going to entertain this foolishness again. We are telling MPP, we are telling NDC, we are telling CPP, all political parties, everybody, they should attend to the roles in Ashama spirit. We have called on that they have not been minded unless election time before they will come and do something. So we have all decided that maybe there is no need for us to vote. Meanwhile, following these concerns by the resident, the member of parliament for Ashaiman, Ernest Nogbe, has initiated a rehabilitation and reshipping of four kilometers of the deplorable roads within the municipality. Uh, I receive on a daily basis complaints from the residents, and not only complaints from the residents themselves, even me myself, I see it, the nature of roads in Ashaiman. Every part of Ashaiman roads, very deplorable, very bad. And the motorists are complaining, the drivers are complaining, everybody, the residents of Ashama, they are complaining. With this series of demonstration, I asked series of questions on the floor of the house. I spoke with the minister himself and everything. We gave ultimatum on the demonstration we even made last time. The assembly was adamant. Up to now, the government, nobody came to our aid. Now, since the complaints are coming from the residents, and I also feel the same, uh, I can uh, sit aloof just to see my people suffer. Now I have resolved that the government is reluctant or refusing to do anything about our rules. So I have to take it upon myself as a member of parliament, an elected person, that everybody is thinking that I should do something about the rule for them to come and reshape it. 